Hello everyone, I'm Jeffrey Brumfield, uh, Director of Electrophysiology for um, Western Kentucky Heart and Lung. Uh, our next session is Cardiac Electrophysiology, or as I like to call it, the spark that makes everything else happen. Uh, and I have the pleasure of introducing our next speaker, uh, Dr. Christopher Ellis, uh, Associate Professor of Medicine, Director of the Cardiac Electrophysiology Lab at Vanderbilt University, uh, Nashville, Tennessee. Dr. Ellis grew up in New York State and received his bachelor's degree in microbiology and immunology uh, from um, Cornell University and his medical degree from the University of Rochester uh, School of Medicine. He completed a combined internal medicine and pediatrics residency and was then chief resident at Vanderbilt uh, and then did his cardiology fellowship there. Uh, did his cardiac electrophysiology fellowship at the University of Michigan and then joined the faculty uh, in the Division of Cardio Cardiovascular Medicine at Vanderbilt. Uh, in addition to his other positions at Vanderbilt, he also created and directs the left atrial appendage closure program and registry at Vanderbilt. Uh, he is also the director of clinical arrhythmia research. Uh, he has published extensively on various topics, including cardiac device lead extraction, atrial fibrillation ablation, and left atrial appendage closure techniques. Um, he is uh, uh, today going to discuss stroke risk reduction in atrial fibrillation. Please welcome Dr. Ellis. Great. I get to close out the show with uh, some pretty pictures and new technology and things that won't uh, involve too much uh, uh, Kaplan Meyer curves and such. Um, let's see here. So here's my disclosures. I do have a fair amount of uh, research projects going and I advise uh, many of the companies that make uh, occlu occlusion devices. Now here's uh, an appropriate a cartoon, of course, here's a rat dying in a uh, stretcher in the hospital, he's bleeding to death, and his faithful uh, ER doc comes by and says to the team, well, luckily the poison that he took was Coumadin, because if it was one of those new things, it, it would have been much worse. <laughs> now, if you're going to bleed to death on an anticoagulant, it doesn't matter what drug you're on. Um, so today, when we see patients with atrial fib, uh, you know, the very we have to keep a clear distinction in our mind about how we're treating the symptoms and treating the disease process uh, versus how we are going to tackle uh, stroke prevention. So most of, pretty much everything I think we talked about today was treating a disease process you could already see, but not about preventing uh, a future outcome. Uh, so the key with AFib, of course, is we want to be able to predict for an individual patient, what's the chances they have an embolic stroke from AFib in the next year, two years, three years, and balance that with their risk of bleeding, and then decide whether they're an appropriate candidate to take an anticoagulant. Uh, so typically, we use the CHADS-2 VAS score these days, most people are familiar with this, but giving us a pretty good target of what your annual risk for stroke is in a fairly linear uh, relation to the score. So generally we get to three or higher. Those are people we would be favoring anticoagulation on. The twos are kind of a coin toss. The zeros and the ones really don't have a high enough rate to warrant anticoagulation. However, <clears throat> there's still patients that have strokes here and there's people out here that don't have strokes. And so this is not a perfect scoring scale. Uh, a few things of note there's a lot of data on biomarkers. We talked about BNP and heart failure. Well, BNP is actually a very good predictor of stroke in AFib. And if your BNP level is elevated, it actually has more predictive power than your CHADS-2 score. Uh, but it is not, it's not in the guidelines yet. The other thing is the uh, autopsy data and TE data suggests the vast majority of left atrial uh, clot that form in AFib occur from the left atrial appendage. And you know there is nothing about <clears throat> there's nothing about the left atrial appendage in our stroke risk score for determining someone's risk, but I can guarantee you the number one thing here to get you two points if you're over age 75 is your age is directly correlating to a reduction in left atrial appendage velocity emptying velocity as we age. So when the appendage doesn't eject blood, it becomes static and fills with clot. But this is not part of 
how we decide to put a patient on a blood thinner or not. Uh, the other part of this that we're doing routinely now is has blood score. So we'll also try to predict your risk of bleeding. And there's a huge overlap, you know, age, hypertension, prior stroke between the CHADS2 score and the has blood score. So in general, patients that are higher risk for stroke are also higher risk for bleed. So be, the balance stinks because the higher your stroke risk, the more likely you are to bleed, but the more likely I am to prescribe you an anticoagulant. In clinical trials uh, of the new anticoagulant drugs, uh, or the non-vitamin K antagonist uh, class, uh, certainly equivalent, in some cases, superior stroke prevention uh, compared to dose-adjusted warfarin uh, with about a 2 to 3 percent annual major bleed risk across all subjects. And that's like 45,000 patients, actually, between the multiple trials. And a study discontinuation rate annually of about 30 percent. So you're giving a prophylactic therapy. Patients are about 70 percent compliant with it. And every year, 3 percent of them will probably stop the drug additionally for major bleeding. In the real world, this is data from uh, hem I just broke my thing. I thought I wasn't going to show you all these curves. All right, but there's not that many more, okay? Trust me. Uh, so what I'm just showing you here is there's a linear decline in adherence to therapy over time. So you're a high-risk patient with AFib. I love you. I love my mother. I put my mother on Eliquis, okay? Now, does she take it? I have no idea. Probably not. And in a few years, I can say that even with more confidence. She's probably not adhering to therapy. My dad couldn't adhere to Pradaxa twice a day, so he takes Xarelto. Uh, so I'm like destined to get AFib, so that's why I'm trying to figure this out. <laughs> now, rest assured, uh, don't worry, generic drugs are coming uh, 17 years from now when, uh, when Eliquis comes off patent. No, doctors waste millions of dollars on brand of medicines. I don't want to get on my soapbox, but bottom line is generic drugs don't save you a dime. Look at Tikasin. Uh, we had this for 17 years. Costs $430 a month uh, for the prescription drug for 60 capsules. Uh, but if you go get the generic Dofetilide now, it's $340 for 40 capsules. So basically, it saves you about $10 a month on a $500 a month drug. So, all right, well, if blood thinners are such a pain, do we have other options, uh, non-pharmacologic options, to prevent stroke? Well, if we fix your AFib, doesn't that get rid of your risk for stroke? All right, let's talk about that. So, in 1998, Dr. Hassegare uh, published this beautiful study demonstrating pulmonary vein-triggered mechanisms for the onset of atrial fibrillation. Since then, uh, we have basically exploded a multi-billion dollar industry on ablating the pulmonary veins. Now, there are definitely patients that you cure AFib by getting rid of PV tachycardia. This is a patient, got a catheter sitting inside a pulmonary vein, lots of crazy electrical signals. This is normal rhythm, normal rhythm, Boom, one extra beat, and then a burst of activity in the pulmonary vein. They go into AFib. We bladed it. This was seven years ago. She's had zero AFib. She has a pacemaker. It's like, okay, there are people that you can fix. So maybe that gets rid of a risk of stroke. I don't know. Well, I'm going to show you more. Uh, so we've moved gradually from burning close to the vein to burning outside the vein. There's a bunch of different uh, technologies. This is a mapping system that basically we use three-dimensional, like, like these procedures have gotten pretty quick. We do them in about two hours, uh, zero fluoroscopy. Uh, I don't wear lead anymore. We do them ultrasound guided. I can watch my catheter contact position. This is a voltage map, so the purple is healthy tissue, and the yellow and red is out at the very ends in the pulmonary vein where you lose electrical signals. Uh, this is a, uh, oops, that was going to play. Can you tag that real quick? Like just put the cursor over it. Should be a little play button in the bottom left, I think. There it goes. So this is like what we're currently doing today. Uh, force sensing has been a huge thing. This little number up here is telling me how hard I'm pressing the tip of my platinum tip three and a half millimeter catheter into the, straight up into the roof of the left atrium during someone's atrial flutter and then boom, they just convert a sinus rhythm. You know, this is, this is good stuff. So we feel confident that we can isolate the pulmonary veins most of the time. Uh, the best data out there using force sensing catheters 
80% of patients with paroxysmal intermittent AFib generally can go a year without any AFib. Uh, one out of five may need a repeat procedure. And the long-term success of that past five, 10 years is probably more like 60%, but there's a ton of factors where we can predict who, who's gonna have recurrence and who isn't. So if I take a prime patient, paroxysmal intermittent AFib, uh, PV triggered, maybe they have one other risk factor. I was questioning putting them on a blood thinner. Well, I put them on it for the ablation, and then I fix them. Did I get rid of their stroke risk? Uh, we still don't really know the answer. There's a bunch of observational studies. This is probably the best one out there uh, that's fairly recent from Sweden. They took their whole population. I mean, we can't do this in the U.S. It's kind of a shame. Uh, but they have 361,913 patients in Sweden with AFib. So they just say, okay, everyone with AFib. Uh, and then we look at patients. Did they get treated with medicine or did they get treated with an ablation? And if they got treated with an ablation, it's about a 30% reduction in the risk of stroke. Uh, presumably, that's patients who had successful outcomes from the procedure. Uh, the big question, you know, is does that, in a randomized trial, could you prove that? Well, that sort of was going on with an important study called Cabana, which is sort of dribbled into completion. It's just taken way too long. And all the techniques that we are using now weren't even available at the beginning of the trial. So people are, gonna, are just going to chew it apart when I think it gets reviewed. Um, and about a third of the patients ended up closing out the study in Russia because nobody else was enrolling. Uh, but that looks interesting. So maybe a 30% reduction in stroke risk if I can ablate away your AFib. Uh, I can get your cardiac mortality less as well if I can convert you from persistent AFib into paroxysmal AFib. So kind of reversing, stepping the disease process back. There's a gradual progression. Most patients start out brief intermittent episodes of AFib, gradually progresses to longer episodes, and then they get stuck in, in AFib persistently or permanently uh, unless we intervene. Um, so in this study out of University of Michigan, when I was there, a bunch of these patients, I'm sure I did their ablations. Uh, basically, that study didn't really show much effect on stroke risk but did show reduced cardiac mortality. So maybe there's a small effect. It's been hard to prove. Randomized trials are gonna be hard to prove that further. I do, and that's with, you know, considering prime candidates. Now, if you have hypertension, your risk for late recurrence is higher. If you are labeled as persistent AFib when we start, considering you for an ablation, your risk is higher, and all these other things that we would like lump into risk factor uh, management sleep apnea, BMI over 30, blood pressure 130 over uh, 85 or higher, you know, multiple other factors, valvular disease, previous cardiac surgery, et cetera. All these are gonna be patients that probably have a higher uh, recurrence rate and thus may not get that 30% uh, reduction in stroke uh, onset that we see with uh, uh, the Swedish study. So again, persistent AFib is tough. One of the things that we, we still don't know. Some persistent AFib patients we do cure with a single catheter ablation, and they're probably people that have like pristine atria otherwise. It's kind of hard to see that. Uh, one center in uh, Utah has a pretty cool fibrosis mapping uh, system with MRI with delayed enhancement, and they can see fibrotic changes in the posterior wall of the left atrium, and then risk stratify patients and basically, if you have stage four or lots of scar, scar tissue, patchy scar in the atria, you're a lot less likely to have a good outcome uh, from an arrhythmia standpoint after ablation. But that's just been very hard to reproduce. Certainly, if we're going to be talking about, this is the key thing here with this whole talk, prophylaxis. So we're trying to prevent an event. So whatever we do to you to prevent an event has got to be safe. It has to be, like, really safe. If I am doing to you persistent AFib ablation with lines and, and, a, and multiple extra steps, you're probably getting between a two and a half and a, maybe an eight percent complication rate uh, of all things. Now some of its complications you don't worry too much about, but they do get labeled as a major complication, like a hematoma in the leg, that type of thing. Uh, but certainly the more you ablate, the more likely you are to cause 
uh, harm to the patient. So I'm not going to stick catheter ablation for AFib as a comparator against taking an anticoagulant to, predict, to prevent stroke at this point. Uh, you can go really extensively and try to do a maze procedure, and you know that certainly does have some benefit uh, on arrhythmia recurrence with pretty good outcomes. This is our hybrid ablation outcome with continuous monitoring on our patients. Uh, they all did really well. They all got their appendage closed in addition to multiple uh, uh, lines and pulmonary vein isolation. So it's a little hard also to say, well, if these patients don't have strokes, is it because I closed the appendage or is it because I fixed their AFib? So let's look at the appendage. Now, if that's 90% of the time the source of the AF-related thrombus that causes an embolic stroke, why are you taking a blood thinner that affects your entire body? Your brain, your kidneys, your toe, uh, you know. Anywhere there's a vessel, the blood thinner is getting in there. We really only care about preventing clot from forming in the left atrial appendage for a fib prote uh, stroke protection. There's obviously other reasons patients have strokes, but the reason you're giving them Eliquis is for the labeling, non-valvular AFib. So that's what we're talking about, AFib stroke prevention. So have you ever had this conversation with one of your patients? Uh, I don't want to take Coumadin, doctor. That's rat poison. Of course you have. Uh, I keep gaining weight because I can't eat my salads and greens. Maybe. Uh, every time I you know, brush my teeth, I bleed. My arms, look at my arms. This is the thing. People hate this. Oh, I'm bruised up all over my arms. I can't go out in public. I mean, it could be Coumadin, it could be age, prednisone, whatever else. Uh, after, this is big though, see, after March, my copay runs out and my Eliquis is costing me $350 a month. That's a problem on compliance. I saw this ad on TV, 1-800-BAD-DRUG, should I be concerned? Okay, every patient I talk to about a left atrial appendage closure device asks me if that's an, this filter that I saw that breaks apart and pokes holes in people's hearts. And it's like, God, so we've got a long way to go on awareness and education. Uh, doctor, can I stop any of my medications? Of course, everybody wants to come off medicines, right? Now, the funny thing is we all train to be physicians, and it's like the allopathic way. What do we do? You have something, I identify it as a disease, and I write you a prescription for that thing, and you should get better. That's how we practice medicine, right? I mean, we prescribe drugs. But every patient wants to do the opposite. They want to stop taking drugs. So we have, a, we have an alternative, which is pretty cool. Uh, what if I'm in a car accident and one I bleed to death, maybe? Uh, and this one, <laughs> my mother died from an AFib-related stroke. I really don't want to have a stroke, doctor. What can you do for me? So as opposed to a medication that has 3% annual major bleed and a 30% discontinuation rate per year in clinical trials, when they're calling them, telling them to take their drug every day, uh, closure of the left atrial appendage with a variety of methods it has 100% compliance. As long as I can deliver the therapy, it is working to protect you from stroke 24-7, all day long. It doesn't go away. If I ligate, clip, remove, or occlude your left atrial appendage, it is no longer part of the process of causing an AFib-related uh, embolic stroke. This is a patient of mine who is on Coumadin. Uh, this is a video, but you can see it anyway. There's a nice fat uh, clot right here in the left atrial appendage. Pretty classic location that we see it when we uh, do TEs when patients come in for a cardioversion. Well, this guy had heart failure, AV node ablation by V pacemaker. And he was on Coumadin. He'd been on Coumadin for years. His INR was like never below 3. His INR was 4.5 when he formed a thrombus in his left atrial appendage. And he was having actually multiple embolic uh, phenomenon through clots to his spleen and his uh, kidney. So this was uh, 2010, so there wasn't a lot of options at the time, but we were doing the hybrid ablations and we decided to do a standalone stand left atrial appendage clip to close his, his appendage. And now he's been, he's been great for years, and he had a few bleeds, we ended up taking him off blood thinners uh, safely, even though this guy had an atrium full of smoke and clot in his left atrial appendage. So uh, the problem with, let's just chop off your left atrial appendage, even if I send you to a cardiac surgeon specifically for that, or I ask them to do it intra-op, there's so many, like, there's a lot of dogma. Oh, I sew it this way, it always works. 
I cut off the appendage and throw it in a bucket. I know it's gone. I use a stapler, like I glue. No. The, when put to the test, stapled occlusion is about 40% effective, and, uh, or sorry, surgical occlusion is about 45% effective, and stapled occlusion is only about 70% effective. So they just don't work. I have a series of patients, I mean, probably a dozen, that have had surgical closure at the time of mitral valve replacement. And then I brought them in, and then they were like, well, it was a bioprosthetic valve, so we're going to take you off anticoagulation. I said, BS. Let me image you. Boom. Appendage is wide open. You know, the stitch breaks. The appendage reopens. And you can't take that patient off anticoagulation. This is an atrial clip, so that's what the clip looks like. We can actually put it in through thoracoscopic surgery. It takes about 35, 45 minutes. The problem is we have to drop your lung on the left, and we have to incise the pericardium. Two things we don't want to have to do if we can avoid it, but that is uh, definitely a way to do this. And uh, we just finished up a study that will pre be presenting at AHA. I can't tell you all the data, but it looks highly effective. So the next step is currently available. There is an endocardial device uh, that has recently been FDA approved. Uh, Medicare covers it, called the Watchman device, which is basically, instead of cutting off or clipping the appendage from outside is basically basically a drain plug to seal the appendage from inside. And the beauty of randomized data is, you know, this kind of stuff. So Protect AF and Prevail were the two randomized trials for this device. I took 600 and some odd patients with AFib, stroke risk, randomized them to Coumadin or Watchman. Five years later, more people alive if you got a Watchman. That's easy. Body count you know, trial done, approved, right? No. Six patients way early in the first part of the study had air emboli because the operators and the techniques weren't careful about air getting into the system. So there were six ischemic strokes in like the first 50 patients that got Watchman devices. And then it just threw the analysis of that uh, endpoint of stroke protection off Long enough, they had to go through three FDA panels <laughs> before it got approved. Eventually, it did. If you actually look at it and take those six patients out and say, now an air embolism is very rare during our left atrial uh, procedures, transeptal puncture is much safer, the equipment's safer, take those patients out, this is like, those curves are separated even further. So here's stroke, uh, basically non inferior, probably superior. Most of that is because there's no or very little hemorrhagic strokes after you've gotten a Watchman device. Uh, patients on Coumadin get hemorrhagic strokes. That's one of the things with the novel drugs that's really nice. They seem to have less hemorrhagic strokes than patients on Coumadin. Uh, so I was actually earlier today reviewing a methods paper uh, for a randomized trial that's uh, just underway in Poland of NOAC versus Watchman slash Amulet, which are two different left atrial appendage closure devices. So that's nice. We'll finally get somebody who's going to test that. Although the drug companies wouldn't fund it and the device companies wouldn't fund it. Nobody wanted to like test Eliquis versus Watchman. No. But it's getting done. Um, this is an example of a safety profile. So as I said, those six early air emboli really kind of hurt the device early on this prophylaxis, because I told you, you gotta, if you're going to prophylax someone against something that hasn't happened, it has to be done very safely. So 8% complications from persistent AF ablation, that's too high for prophylactic stroke prevention. But look what's happened with Watchmen as we've gone along. Most recent uh, registry out of Europe with uh, 1,000 plus Watchmen implants in most of the, like a ton of these are brand new operators is down to 2.7%. Um, I do a lot of left atrial stuff. I've done about 60 cases. We haven't had any on the table complications. I'm expecting over time that ought to be 1%. Like once that gets to 1%, it's a very, very viable first line uh, stroke prevention therapy head to head against any anticoagulant. Uh, the benefit of closing your appendage, not surprisingly, comes late, whoops which is where patients are not on anything anymore. Like once it endothelializes, you're good. You're off blood thinners, you're off antiplatelet therapy. You know, that's when you really see a huge difference in bleeding events. 
Because the obviously the longer you're on an anticoagulant, the more likely you are to bleed. The nice thing with these devices is that it's pretty simple. Uh, it basically takes me about 30, 45 minutes. 7,500 bucks for the device. Uh, so even out of pocket, you know, you, you want to pick up the whole bill. It's probably about 15,000. Zarelto costs you 4,000 a year, you know, so three, four years. Basically, if you don't want to even think about having to take a drug, you could even pay out of pocket for this now. It's cost effective versus Coumadin or NOAC currently, although it takes longer to get cost effective against Coumadin because Coumadin's pretty cheap. So you got to, so the younger patient with an appendage closure gets more cost benefit, obviously, than an elderly patient. But it's certainly not like, as opposed to, I think, the general consensus, this is going to break the bank for Medicare. No, it's actually going to save Medicare money. They just need to step back and like look at the data and look at the bills and, and see how many patients come in in the future with, let's say, you're on Zarelto and kind of a ha high has blood score patient. Uh, come into the ER with a GI bleed, near fatal, it's middle of the night, you're like gushing blood, there's no one around on call, and they have to go get, get uh, a Dexanet, which is hopefully going to get FDA approval, uh, which is a reversal agent for factor 10A, right? So if you bleed, and I give you a Dexanet, <laughs> boom, I just spent $200,000, oh yeah, like one day, I could have bought 10 Watchmans for that, I mean, crazy. Anyway, that, that's, that's coming, and I hear from the, from the pharmacists uh, at multiple hospitals, including at Vanderbilt, they know they're going to get price gouged like crazy when that drug gets approved, F, just FYI. Um, the other interesting thing on appendage closure that we're working on also is uh, the effect of removing the appendage on atrial fibrillation itself, and that is under study in something called the AMAZE trial. Uh, we're one of the main centers on this, and basically, if we, sew, if we basically tie off your left atrial appendage and it necroses, it turns out that may get rid of uh, about 20% of your AFib, uh, AFib burden. So in addition to stroke prevention, it could have a therapeutic effect, and it may get labeled for that. This is the other device available in Europe that's just starting clinical trial in the United States, Amulet versus Watchman, uh, and uh, we'll be a center for that as well. The nice thing with this is I don't have to go very far into the appendage to deliver the amulet device. The Watchman device, maybe one out of 20 patients, if your appendage is too short, it's going to be very difficult to get the sheath deep enough to deploy uh, the device, where this one, I can kind of just go in maybe a centimeter, uh, open up the inner disc, has little hooks that hold here and here, and then pull back and open up the uh, occlusive disc. The data on this looks pretty good in a registry, but it's not been in a randomized trial yet. So it's interesting. They, they'll probably get their device approved and available in the U.S. if they have a non-inferiority endpoint, Watchman versus Amulet, but they'll never have to test their device against an anticoagulant. Uh, so the great thing in this study, uh, for, and for you guys if you have patients, like, they don't have to take, and right now the weird thing with, Coom, with uh, Watchman is you have to take Coumadin for 45 days when we deliver the device, uh, and then you can come off of it uh, if the follow-up TE looks good. Uh, in the study with the amulet device, you wouldn't have to uh, take any anticoagulant. Uh, they can uh, only do aspirin flavix if you, if you uh, feel that's the, the appropriate thing. Uh, just not to shed uh, too much on the prophylaxis, again, take a look at the people that would probably be the highest risk uh, anticoagulation population and a high-risk population for intervention of any kind, uh, renal failure patients. And it turns out, if you look uh, right now, this data is from Europe uh, in a series, let's say how many patients it was, 375 patients out of the ACP cohort. So these patients got AMPLATS closure device or the amulet that I was just showing you. Um, but basically still getting uh, about a 60% reduction in stroke rate and a significant reduction in bleeding risk. Uh, by closing the appendage in these patients. So uh, one strange thing with Watchman, the way it's labeled by FDA, is that this is a device for patients with atrial fibrillation who have increased stroke risk, uh, but who's, and, and who are indicated for an anticoagulant, but who the physician and patient uh, agree or decide are not good candidates to be on long-term anticoagulation. So it's not really clearly defined who is a Watchman candidate. 
Um, in general, it's probably people with a CHADS 2 score of 3 or higher, HasBlood score of 3 or higher, uh, in some event. I mean, we don't usually do it if you've not had an obvious issue with an anticoagulant. Uh, but a group of patients I didn't even think about a few weeks ago, I talked to one of my nephrologists on the renal transplant team, and they were like, this is brilliant. And so I've done like three people that are waiting for renal transplant because if you're a renal transplant patient and you're on an anticoagulant, and they call you at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, you just took your Xarelto. Oh, you just lost your kidney. Sorry, I can't operate on you for 72 hours. So we're going to have to give that organ to somebody else. So that's actually like a great population of patients who the interruption or the management, comp, you know, uh, whatever risks or, you know, it's just difficult to manage those patients when they're waiting for a transplant. Uh, and they have such a high bleeding risk uh, with any of the novel anticoagulants. Obviously, you could reverse Coumadin, but it's still, it's not ideal. So, real quick case. Uh, unfortunately, I had some nice videos, but they're not going to play, but you'll kind of get the picture. Uh, this is a guy, this is a classic watchman candidate of mine, a 78-year-old man. Ischemic cardiomyopathy, on Coumadin, a bunch of falls, GI bleeding. Uh, he also was on aspirin plavix, so he's on triple therapy actually. So that's another can you know another population of patients. Triple therapy patients uh, certainly are going to be at very high bleeding risk, and uh, he has increased has blood score and a high uh, CHADS two score. So he comes in for screening TEE. We're kind of getting going, taking some pictures. About 12:50, anesthesia gets some nice images here. So that's a nice deep left atrial appendage, and it's not excessively wide. So this is kind of like what you want to see when you're in a rush. We stick the inner atrial septum a little bit low. This is probably too much mid. I'd like to be a little more posterior uh, in this view. Here's a nice, but we, we, I think we restuck because here's where the sheath ended up. Nicely posterior, away from the aorta. Plenty of room to move in and then enter and engage the left atrial appendage. The device is attached to a little cable. We've reached down and, and sat it just about a centimeter below the Coumadin ridge. Really nice squeeze there. It's basically compressed. Uh, you always want to oversize the device by a good 20% if you can. And here in its final deployed position, 30 minutes later, boom, sealed. Funny thing, he comes back for his follow-up TE at six weeks. Uh, they call me. I go, look, perfect, stop Coumadin. He goes out to the checkout counter to check out and he trips, falls, cracks his head on, on the concrete, but he, and amazingly, did not bleed. <laughs> Got him off everything. Now he's doing great, and he's on, he's on nothing. He's passed his, his six months of dual antiplatelet therapy, so he's on baby aspirin alone. Um, but that was, <laughs> that was one of those I was like, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> uh, so in conclusion, on appendage and stroke, there's a lot of patients with AF and stroke uh, protection is a prophylactic therapy that you know, we apply to a population, a large population of patients. It has a cost, the benefit is stroke reduction, uh, and the risk is bleeding. So it's always a balance for every individual patient. It's nice to finally have an option other than just anticoagulants. Uh, in the trials you know, with the novel drugs, they definitely have some appealing uh, features for which, I, like I said, I, my mom and dad are not on Coumadin, I can tell you that. Uh, but it turns out occlusion of the appendage may be a very nice option for the high-risk uh, patient. And it's not crazy expensive, and it's 100% compliance. I'd say that, you know, I've had probably two people that we didn't, the device just didn't stick, <laughs> so we took it out and sent them for an atria clip. Uh, so we ended up getting 100% of them closed. But you're probably not going to get delivery of therapy to 100% of patients. With, an, with a single available occlusion device in the US, just because of the variation in anatomy is phenomenal of the left atrial appendage. But as we start getting more like Europe, and we actually have 10 or 12 devices to choose from, I think we'll be able to tailor this therapy and probably deliver it you know, with a 99% efficacy with a 1% complication rate, and it should be a very viable uh, stroke protection strategy for many of our patients. Thank you. Happy to take some questions.
So, Dr. Alice, when you get called on a patient who has an embolic stroke, and they work that patient up, they found nothing, no AFib, normal heart, would you screen them for AFib and how? Yeah, we've, I mean, we've definitely been more proactive about putting loop recorders in, in patients that have uh, sort of a idiopathic stroke. Um, and uh, there's pretty good data that picks up a fair amount of uh, asymptomatic AFib. So just because, yeah, you're on 48-hour Holter monitor in the hospital on telemetry and you don't see anything, that does not mean the patient doesn't have AFib. In fact, the, the odd thing, though, is with the more we look at it, patients have pacemakers and other continuous monitors, the actual timing that when a patient shows up with a stroke does not really have a good correlation to whether they're in sinus rhythm or AF. So, you know, you could have AF two weeks prior for two hours and then nothing. You put them on a, a one-week monitor, they have no AFib, they show up with a stroke and you'll totally miss it. Um, so, yeah, we're pretty aggressive about monitoring for that. Uh, but a continuous loop recorder is probably way better than surface monitoring, and it actually ends up being less expensive in the long run than sort of multiple negative holders. You get paid for doing that loop mm -hmm. recorder for yep. idiopathic stroke? Yeah, I mean, a lot of those, if it's in the setting of an inpatient, you know, they'll probably just eat it up in the hospital bill. Uh, they're not, they're about 5000 I think, total cost, maybe something like that. Um, probably doesn't need to be that much. They're, they're pretty simple devices, but... Uh -huh. uh, is there any um, study going on to look at using like either no X or just dual antiplatelet for a while for that yeah, 40 days? Sure. There's a one. There's a registry already published on it. It's called the ASAP registry, which is basically aspirin plavix in a high risk population with Watchmen, and they did find, but it wasn't randomized data. It was prospective registry. Uh, there is, uh, like I mentioned, there's actually a study in Europe that's just started. Uh, they've done about 90 patients out of 600, which will be. Um, NOAC, any NOAC versus any Watchman or Amulet device. It's so kind of up to the operator. Um, so that, that's ongoing. Uh, you know, we're probably not going to get great NOAC versus device, like straight randomized trial head to head, because uh, the funding for that will be difficult. This study I reference is funded by the Polish government. I ask Dr. Ellis to make himself available after the award ceremony for any sure. other questions that we have. Thank you so much. Thanks. Has everyone had a good day? Yes. Oh, I think we can do better than that. Has everyone had a good day? Good. Let's give a round of applause to all of our moderators and speakers today. This is our awards uh, presentation ceremony. I am Jake Barrett, the Residency and Fellowship Program Coordinator at the Medical Center. So as a part of this year's cardiology uh, symposium, three cardiology fellows submitted four poster presentations. Representing the University of Louisville are Drs. Matthew Keith and Abdur Khan. Representing the Medical Center at Bowling Green is Dr. Jason Cohen. So to our cardiology fellows who submitted poster presentations, thank you. I'd also like to thank our judges, Dr. Akbar and Dr. Abdul Wahid, both from Western Kentucky Heart and Lung Associates. So today's poster presentation winner receives a plaque and a check for $250. So for his poster presentation title, and bear with me, <laughs> Does stop flow technique improve cardiac retention of intracoronarily delivered cells? A study of cardiac retention of CKIT positive human cardiac stem cells after intracoronary infusion in a porcine model of chronic ischemic cardiomyopathy. <laughs> <laughs> So the 2016 Cardiovascular Symposium Poster Presentation Award goes to Dr. Matthew Keith. <laughs> Dr. 
Governor Keith had to head back to Louisville, so I will be accepting his <laughs> award <laughs> on his behalf. I, uh, <laughs> I, uh, I feel like we're at the Oscars here. <laughs> I guess we can all split his check. How about that? <laughs> So at this time, I would like to turn it back over to our host, Dr. Mohan Kazmuddin, and I would like to invite Dr. Jackie Dawson to the stage. <coughs> Thank you so much, guys. Uh, it was a very hectic day, but I think we have uh, learned a lot uh, today. So ja I just want to say a few things about Jackie. Jackie has only made us proud since she began working with us. When I first met her, she struck me as a promising, intelligent young woman with a lot of potential. She has proven me right from the get-go. I shared my vision of symposium with her two years ago and she has executed this with such excellence and dedication that is hard to match. She has spent endless hours coordinating, planning this event with others involved. Her single-minded purpose, devotion and dedication always impresses me. I see a great future for her in academics. Currently, she is serving as the Associate Director for the Fellowship Program and I have no doubts that she will be a great role, role model and a mentor for our fellows. All her colleagues, staff and patients uniformly like her and respect her immensely. I would therefore like to honor her with our Western Kentucky Research Foundation Award for Excellence and I would request Dr. Michael Byrne to come onto the stage to do this honor. Ladies and gentlemen, please give her a round of applause, Dr. Jacqueline Dawson. I think Dr. Kazadeen asked me to give this to you because I have a weakness for Jamaican beautiful women who are talented. Research Foundation and Education Trust, the Medical Center and the Medical Center Heart Institute are grateful to our accomplished guest speakers who have taken the time out of their very busy schedule to be with us today. Thank you very much. Uh, three or four of them had to leave um, this afternoon, so they're not here, but we certainly will send them a letter of appreciation. To our panelists, thank you very much for providing your input in the various sessions. This was very much appreciated. To Miss Vivian Grice, Kate Lantham, and the Western Kentucky Heart and Lung Ambassadors, a round of applause to you all. They, did, they really did a really amazing job. Um, right after last year's symposium, we were like, we have to do this again. It should be an annual event. I think the, the wealth of information is tremendous. and. You know, for our city here of Bowling Green, it is needed, so it will continue. Uh, we are very appreciative of all that you've put in for the last um, one year planning this event as well. To the executive chef, John Hammock, uh, Joyce and Kayla and Kevin Childers and the rest of the Old Stone staff management, the food was delectable and the service was outstanding as usual. Thank you very much. Thank Rebecca Lee for doing this. No, uh, you did? 
I really have to say that. Okay. <laughs> to, to Jake Barrick and Adina Husick and Vivian McClellan and the rest of the medical education, uh, graduate medical education at the medical center and all that education department responsibility for the CME credits and for helping us to organize this. Uh, we're truly appreciative. Uh, thank you. Uh, really thank you to our sponsors and for um, everything and for their symposium grant probably without that this will be um, impossible I really want to thank Rebecca Lee Rebecca you were with us last year you're with us this year again I cannot begin to thank you for every single thing you've done all the organization of the newspaper letters um, the booklets that look fabulous, everything is very well done and your, without your input we would not be able to do this. So thank you very much. I also would like to thank all the fellows who participated in the poster presentation. This will be a yearly event. We will open it to residents and students next year, so stay tuned. Start planning to present from, next, from, from now, for next year. And finally, uh, again to the Medical Center, the Medical Center Heart Institute, it really was an honor for us to partner with you. Thank you. Thank you. Jake Barrick and Adina Hussein. <laughs> thank you. To, thank you to everyone for coming. Um, stay tuned for more information for Cardiovascular Symposium 2017. Thanks.